and welcome to Lucian's Youth Theatre Open Doors event. LYT offers free drama, performance and technical theatres projects for young people who live or learn near Lucian. My name is Amiga. I've been at LYT for a very long time. It's a really good experience. Um, and I'm currently working with the young producers and I am also a part of the Senior Youth Theatre Acting Company. Um, I'm Kirsty. I'm currently on a gap year. I'm going to study English at Oxford next year and I'm interested in playwriting. Um, so we're both part of the Young Producers Project. Uh, this is a new project by LYT to help young people discover what it means to be a producer and get first-hand experience of producing an event like this. Um, so our, over the last few months, we've been working together to organize um, opening doors with the help of the LYT team. So today's event will be run by us, the young producers, and also Victoria and Molly. So firstly, to give you more information on what to expect, um, this, this is a panel discussion um, with some amazing professionals from the creative industries. We are, of course, working over Zoom, so please bear with us um, in case we have any technical difficulties. We'll do our best to get things back up and running as swiftly as possible. Um, we're super keen for you, the audience, to be as involved as possible, because even though we're not together in person, we want you to make sure you feel connected. Um, so we want to know a bit more about you, and so we'll be asking some questions in a few polls during the event. We'll start off with the Young Producers team asking questions that we have created for the panelists. But if you have um, questions for them, type, type them in by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer or laptop, or the top um, if you're on your phone. One, uh, one of our team is monitoring these and we'll put your questions to the panel. And now we'd like to introduce Victoria. Hi everyone, I'm Victoria. I'm Lewisham Youth Theatre's Executive Director and I've also been supporting the young producers on this project. Um, we have three sections for the event. In the first, we're going to hear from the panelists um, about what they do and their inspirations for getting into their field. And um, then we'll hear about how they make the decisions uh, about the work that they're doing now. And finally, we'll talk about um, overcoming obstacles, getting into and working in the creative industries. Um, we have a pretty tight time frame, and we want to make sure that we hear from everyone and we also have time um, for some audience questions. So I'm going to be the bad cop and um, I might be popping up on the video screens. And, and if I do, that's probably time to wind up your answers. But I'm going now. Bye. We want to start um, with a few questions for you, our audience. For this bit, we're sending out a poll and all you need to do is click and submit your answer. These answers will be anonymous, um, but in a moment, you'll be able to see a percentage result. Over to you, Elijah and Alicia. Hi, I'm Alicia and I am passionate about acting. Hi, I'm Elijah. I'm studying media at, at Shewis Hill College, and this is my first project with LYT, Lucian Youth Theatre. We've just sent out two questions to the audience. One question is, are you currently studying and working in the creative industry? The other question, hold on, hold on. Which role is in the creative industry you must, you're interested in working in? So please make sure and answer the polls now. Okay, so let's have a look and see what you guys are saying. So majority of you are studying and working in the industry, which was yes. And the rest of you on the second question, which was you're most interested in acting.
Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So whilst you were waiting for this event to start, you may have seen some presentations on our panelists and the things that inspire us about them. We're going to start off with a quick fire round. Um, that means we're going to ask our panelists to tell us their name, their role, and to very quickly list the three most important tasks that they might do on a daily basis in their job. So Inua, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, could you repeat the question again? Yeah, sure. So we would just like you to it's a quick fire round, round to list three most important tasks that you might do on a daily basis. Three most important tasks I might do on a daily basis. I have a project management software on my phone app. It's an app called Things. Check things um, to, um, um, what else? Um, check for trolls on Twitter. <laughs> Um, and three, um, text my mum. Thank you, Inua. And um, Ria, how about you? Hello, uh, my name is Ria Zmitrovich and um, I'm an actor. And the three most important tasks I might do on a daily basis are read books and watch films, um, keep up to date with current things by listening to podcasts or reading the news, um, and probably call a friend, um, yeah, to not be lonely. <laughs> awesome, thanks Ria. Um, Roy, can we hear from you next? Absolutely. Oh. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Roy Alexander-Weiss. I am the Joint Artistic Director and Joint CEO of the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester. And the three things that I do on a daily basis are um, communicate with lots of people, whether it's the staff team at the, um, at the Royal Exchange or outside or stakeholders, Arts Council, that kind of thing. Um, looking at spreadsheets, lots of spreadsheets and my, like money, budgets, all of that, which is very, very new to me um, and not necessarily the most comfortable part of my job, but something that I'm growing to love. Um, and then keeping connected with the world, I guess, like Ria said, um, staying up to date with like the news and um, the conversations that are happening in our industry, um, especially right now um, with COVID and everything. Um, yeah, doing lots of trying to keep up to date with, with what's happening in the world. Thank you, Roy. Um, now, Clancy, um, could you please introduce yourself and tell us three tasks that you might do on a daily basis? Hi, everyone. I'm Clancy. I'm a lighting designer. Uh, my most important tasks would probably be drawing lighting plans and specifying equipment for upcoming shows and thinking about what I need for my upcoming shows. Um, probably going to rehearsals and doing script analysis and to create cue lists for any shows I'll be doing in the future. And uh, normally I'd be in a theatre building looks. Um, it's kind of all on hold right now, but on a normal day. Cool. Um, thanks, Clancy. So, um, audience, if there's anything you're finding surprising about what our panellists are saying, how they're describing what they do on a daily basis, please let us know in the Q&A box. Um, now for our next panellist, Lucien, could you introduce yourself and tell us your three tasks? Hello everybody. Hi, hello. Uh, I'm Lucien Msamanati, actor, writer, producer, director. My three daily creative tasks are always make sure I do three pages of journaling or note taking every day. I then make sure that I do a little bit of sketching or drawing. And then thirdly, is always to make sure that all the practical needs of the day are, uh, are ready to rock and roll and, and go. Thank you, Lucian. Um, let's come to you next, Jermaine. Yeah, one second. Hi, I'm Jermaine. Um, I'm a freelance video editor and co-owner of a boutique post-production house. Um, I'd say my three main things of the day is probably getting up in the morning, 
to probably do some sort of exercise because we don't really get much time to do it and um, probably brew up as well which includes probably talking and catching up with people and then I'll probably listen up um, to what the daily um, regime will be so yeah that's probably my three um, B, do we have any feedback from our audience about what they found um, surprising? Hi, um, I'm B. Um, yeah, someone from the audience says they didn't realise there was so much reading involved in acting. Thanks, B. Um, we now want to ask the panellists about the inspirations for getting into the creative industries and what those first steps were like. B has the first question. Hi, I'm B. Um, this is my first project with LYT and I'm studying English and Arts at A-level. Um, so for my first question, we thought we'd start this section by asking you all um, one of the following questions. So, either who or what inspired you to start a career in the creative industries or what was your first big break? Um, Roy, can we hear from you first? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a really good question. My, I would say um, the inspiration for getting into theatre was, um, and into the arts, I guess, was, um, I, I grew up in, like, I don't know, my family was a bit unorthodox. And I feel like when I went into youth theatre by, like, accident, I found, like, a tribe. I found people that I connected with. I found, like, a home and a family. And um, I guess I really became excited and interested by the idea that like I could create work or create an environment where people can create work where every time the lights go down or not, whenever you, you know, congregate together to hear a story that actually in that moment we create a tribe, we create a community and we all bear witness and experience this thing and then hopefully this thing will have take, you know, will do something in us and we can take that on into the world beyond the theatre or whatever space it is that you're creating that piece of art for. Um, so yeah, that was the thing that I guess really inspired me. It was like um, community and home. Yeah, great, thank you. What inspired you to become a light, lightning um, designer? Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I did do a couple other things. I was in a band, I was worked in a funeral home, but I've always had a real passion for theatre and design. Um, I'm from New York, so I got to see, go see shows on Broadway when I was a kid, I was exposed to a lot of the arts. Um, and then when I went back to university, um, I knew I wanted to make theatre, but I'd originally kind of thought, oh, I'll be a set designer, maybe. But then I got to university and I discovered lighting and uh, I found out that it was like this really hands-on, incredibly technical thing. And um, I was someone who kind of grew up being torn between doing like a craft with my hands or something technical and also loving the arts, being passionate about the arts. Um, so when I discovered lighting, which is this great way to combine something really geeky and technical and uh, uh, just like not necessarily airy fairy um cre creative i really got excited about something i could get my hands in um and then yeah so i kind of started out as a production electrician and a programmer and um clawed my way up towards lighting design um from that technical background um and i just have always loved that combination of the electronic with the creative thank you um, and you, in your, we're interested, um, as a poet, how did you get interested in playwriting and what was your first big break? Um, I, I, I got tired of reading poetry to drunk people in um, festivals scattered across um, England and um, had a really disastrous, horrible um, experience in Glastonbury. And when I came back to London, I was so happy to be in the city that when I got off the coach at um, um, London, um, Victoria, I kissed the pavement. 
And when I when I, I was back in the city and I liked that I could control the environments, I wanted to go into environments where I could decide all the elements in which the tech that I wrote could be delivered and theater um, afforded me that. So I ran to theater because I wanted the illusion of control. Um, and um, I, my first play was really a long, um, a long poem called The 14th Tale. And it was commissioned by the Battersea Arts Center and penned in the margins. And I performed it and I was on a few um, theater production companies came to see it. And one of them was called Fuel and they wanted to work and develop the show with me and, we, and which they did. We got a little pot of money to take to finish the show at the Arcola Theater. And then we took it to the Edinburgh Festival in 2009 where it won a fringe first. And then the following year it um, transferred to the National Theater in 2010. So that was my first play. Thank you, Inua. Um, Jermaine, you studied media um, in university. How did you get your first job in film editing? Sorry, um, you're on mute. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I finished university, um, I always knew there was a, a placement course um, available, which um, helped ethnic minorities to get into the TV and film industry. Um, obviously, things like that are not about anymore, so it's quite difficult sometimes. Um, government don't usually put them on. Um, so I applied for this placement scheme, which gives you one year placement at a, a number of different types of jobs, and one of them was editing. Um, but on the day, of going there, it was literally like being at The Apprentice, um, where everyone was giving, in, giving the best they could do. So it was quite overwhelming, um, it was at the time. But obviously I kept my head down, I had to do all these tasks throughout the day. Um, and then I remember speaking to a woman outside who was actually the sister of one of the directors of the companies who I was actually wanting to go for. Um, and then after that, um, obviously the whole day went past and then I got the phone call to actually say um, I got onto the course. So I was literally over the moon. But when I actually spoke to the director of the company, he said I, I was not his first choice. <laughs> and there was actually someone in front of me, but she decided to go with somebody else. So I, d I felt even more lucky that I actually got in just um, by the skin of my teeth really um, and I think the conversation that I had with his sister which he didn't know about kind of pushed me him to pit me over somebody else as well apparently so yeah I think it was a uh, very lucky and that's how uh, I started my first year placement after university. Thank you. Um, we are, um, wait so I think I'm on the right um sorry i think i'm on the wrong page actually um yeah lucian um yeah. lucian you've worked a lot in theater for most of your career and now you're doing more in tv and film are you more inspired to work in one or the other the level of inspiration is equally the same in both they are the two sides of the same coin both offer different challenges both offer different rewards and the energy and the technicality of, of both feed the other. So all of it is inspirational and, 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 and enhancing and empowering. All right, thank you. Um, great, and finally, let's hear from um, you, Ria. You once said that you um, auditioned for the National Youth Theatre in part because you thought it would be um, be a fun day out in London. What made you want to keep um, pursuing your dream? Um, yeah, I did. I really didn't expect to to get in, um, but I gained a lot of confidence being accepted into the National Youth Theatre, and also met like loads of creative people and started to learn that it's actually possible to be an actor um, as a job. I don't think I'd really realised that before then. 
uh, and I really enjoy being part of a team and bringing a play to life and also really believe in the power of using stories to provoke empathy and inspire social change. Um, but it's always felt like a vocation to me rather than just a, a, like a job or a career. I really love it and like I'm a huge fan of theatre and actors and writers and directors and everyone who makes theatre, um, which is probably what has got me through all of the, the times out of work and the rejection and things like that. Um, is that it's just a real passion. Um, thank you, Ria, and thank you, everyone. Uh, that was really interesting. Before we go on to our next section, B, are there any questions from the audience about inspiration and breaking into the industry? Um, yes. A few of the panellists said they read books daily. Um, so the first question is, um, from the audience, how important is it to read books and what type of book? So would anyone like to answer that question? Yeah. Uh, Lucien, go ahead. Okay, go Lucien. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Look, reading, filling yourself with knowledge, filling yourself with ideas, you, you are never going to have a bad trip. They all feed into your command of language, your understanding of language, your understanding of how different voices work, how different characters are created. It is a, we, we operate in a land of words and magic. But if you don't embrace those words daily, constantly, if you don't do that work, you don't grow. Um, and, but the, the thing to remember is that it's also joyous. I think sometimes schooling, has, has drummed into us the, this idea that, oh, reading is a drag, reading is, oh, no, reading is great. I mean, you know, we read scripts, <laughs> you know, it is, uh, it all feeds what we do. It is all part of the, the creative vocabulary. And I think it is essential. As much as you go to the gym, as much as you watch uh, videos, movies, whatever, reading is equally as important. It just makes you hold and it opens up a world of thousands of lives and that can only be a good thing for all of us as creative artists. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question which is what would any one of you recommend to someone who is trying to progress in drama? Anyone interested in answering that question? <laughs> Lucy and yeah. or, or should we go for Roy? Yeah. Um, uh, what? Say the question again, just so that I know that the answer I have in my head is not. A good um, the question was: What would any one of you um, recommend to someone who is trying to progress in drama? Um, yes. Uh, the thing, the the thing that I would recommend, I guess, is. Um, is to find your own path. I think sometimes we, we like, it, whilst it's really important to know that there are other people who have done this, that you recognize that you can connect with, um, you, it's really important, I think, to remember that you are not them and that everybody's, like Jermaine was saying about his very, very particular journey, the likelihood of that exact thing happening to somebody else is quite slim. So everybody's experience and journey through um, a career or trying to, to like forge a career is gonna be different and different things work for different people. And it is important to take inspiration from, from different people, but maybe not to like pin like all of your dreams and hopes in one individual actually, that you can absolutely beg and borrow and steal ideas and, and everything from everyone because that's what we all do. Um, and it's about finding the things that work for you. Awesome, uh, thank you. Over to you, Amiga. Okay, so um, in this um, section, we'll like to hear more about the work you do and how you make decisions on what to take on. The first question comes from Jonathan. Um. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm studying animation, filmmaking and graphics. This is my first project with LYT. This is our first wildcard question, which means that anyone from the panel can answer it. 
panelists, please let us know if you'd like to answer. The question is, what is the best thing about your job? Um, Jermaine, would you like to answer that? Um, I can kind of, I'll, yeah, I guess so. Um, I guess it's after like all these creative people having their little part in each little bit at the begin at the start of a project, and I guess just seeing it all come together right at the end is probably one of the most satisfying things. And seeing everybody's reaction as well, I guess, um, is yeah, so I think like most of the time it's priceless because I, um, you can go through a lot of like, I don't know, maybe a couple of late nights, pressure and stuff like that. But then the release at the end is, um, is usually worth it <laughs> for some reason because we keep on coming back to do it again. So, and I think that's where, that, I would say that was probably my favorite thing about it. And obviously it always not being the same as well is good. It's yeah. like every project is different usually to the other as well. Okay, thank you, Jermaine. Um, would Zadea like to answer as well? Um, I think actually, Inua, did you have your hand up for this question earlier? Yeah. Um, so I'm a writer and um, the basis of my work is writing down beef between people, writing out conflict. Um, and I think figuring it out um, how conflict works, the nature of, of interaction and how to dramatize that is, um, is, one, of, is, is one of the most interesting things of, of, of my work because it really, it can be extremely nuanced and it can be a huge thing. It can be from just a side eye from someone and that's the most dramatic thing that happens in a scene to an all out conflict between two kings with wars, et cetera. So understanding and drilling down into the nature of beef into gossip, into interaction, all of that delicious, delicious stuff that makes up all the terrible um, reality TV shows that we work, trying to really understand the full stretch of that is one of um, the fun things of my job. Okay, thank you. Um, over to Alicia. Hi, um, Roy. What is the difference between working in the venue as an artistic director to being a freelance director? Um, I, I would say the difference is, so I don't know, it's, it's easier to start talking about like what's similar. So the things that are similar is that you are responsible for assembling people, giving people a sense of direction, like something to head towards, inspiring people on that journey, um, carving out a route. Um, ahead and, and strategically thinking about how you get there, collaborating with lots of people. So I think I do a lot of that still as an artistic director, but it's not, but in a way those skills are taken out of the context of a rehearsal room and put more in, in a wider workplace. And it's, I guess the big difference is that I work in an office more times than in the actual theatre now which is something that I'm still like um, getting to grips with. And also um, there's a lot of talk of like <laughs> money and spreadsheets and budgets, which I, <laughs> I, I guess like as a freelance artist, I was like easy to just go like, yeah, no, I don't really care about that. That's not got anything to do with me because <laughs> I'm not like that great at thinking of the business side. Or, or at least I didn't think I was. Um, but actually when I can, I guess when I can imagine like the way in which we want our space to operate or how we want to operate for people, having that like sense of clarity of vision, I guess, um, in a way it's like seeing or imagining a production. I, I give an entire company that idea and try and navigate that. But um, I guess that yeah it's just so much hard, harder because there's so many more people to manage you're in meetings much more than any like yeah it's, it's it's a lot busier and I guess you feel a huge sense of responsibility and whereas it would be to your audience and to the artists that you're making the work with 
um, as an artistic director, the responsibility is about the finance of the company. Um, the responsibility is about the experience that people have when they come into the building, let alone the show. Um, the responsibility is also looking after that show. It's making sure that, that we're a, a, a fair and equal and inclusive place for people to work as well. So it's like a lot of the things that you do as the director, but like scaled up so much more. Um, yeah. Hi, Lucian. Um, in 2015, you played Iago in Othello at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, this was the first time that Iago had been played by a black actor ever. Um, often this character's actions are viewed as racist. Did this, did this affect your interest or desire in taking the role? And what considerations did you have to take? Um, the historical connotations of, and the performance history of the play had no influence whatsoever in my decision to take the part. And in fact, I had been approached uh, some time earlier about by another uh, theatre company uh, about the possibility of me playing the role of Othello and I said rather prophetically I said well first of all Othello isn't my favourite Shakespeare um, and secondly the only role I'd ever be interested in playing would be Iago so unless you're offering me Iago uh, thanks but no thanks and a few months later my agent said be careful what you wish for um, Iago landed on my lap um, and for me, it was much more a question about mining and finding the truth of the character for myself and the story for myself and for the world that we uh, had created. And uh, I, I made a very conscious and active decision and I've made it throughout my career as an artist to go, I approach something as an artist first and coming at it complete as who I am. Whatever limitations or ideas that surround any particular project, that's for the outside world. I do not look at, look at something uh, because of my, based on, on race, class, education, whatever. I find all those distinctions personally to be quite dull and limiting. Um, and sometimes, yes, you have to be hard-nosed and go, no, that's the one that I want because that's the one that interests me as an artist. And, you know, nine times out of 10, Yes, it's going to be it's, it's going to be satisfying. And the one time out of turn that it isn't satisfying or doesn't work, well, that's the job. That's what we do. You know, we're not in the business of making hits. We're in the business of making art. <laughs> so dive in. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Iago is definitely very interesting. Um, thank you, Sarah Jane. Hi, I'm Sarah Jane, and I'm part of LYT's technical crew, Clancy. You've worked on West End shows, but you've also worked on immersive shows, such as Train Spot in Live. What is the difference in difficulty between your first ever show and your most recent? Okay, um, so my first professional show was like 10 years ago and it was a straight play. And back then I'd say I was still very much focused on the basics of light design you know, getting nice depth and look with color, defining time and space as the staging needs. And I wasn't, I wasn't doing much else, to be honest, when I started besides maybe like a jazzy transition state. And I was working with um, an all generic rig. Um, so just tungsten, you could only point it one place and it was one color and working with the last generation of uh, lighting desks. So it was a much simpler <laughs> kind of world. Um, my most recent show, it actually it didn't open because of COVID, but it was at Sadler's Wells and it was the dance show with the Julie Cunningham company. Um, and when you're doing dance and there's pretty much no set, lighting is doing all the work. You're doing all the form, creating the space, um, as well as doing all the, the normal stuff in terms of where are we, what's the rhythm, what's, what colors are we using. Um, so there, there's a lot more to think about, a lot more to determine. Uh, from a lighting point of view. Um, and from a technical point of view, uh, you know, you have LEDs now, a massive rig, everything's moving lights. So in some ways it's a lot more challenging, technically speaking, but it's also a lot more flexible. You can make a lot more decisions in the moment. You can change the color, you can change the angle as you're working. And that's really cool. Um, and, you know, other more recent things like immersives have like their own kind of time code systems, difficulties, and a lot of my uh, 
more recent stage show have a lot of moving parts. Like if you look at maybe Acts of God at the vaults that I did in December, it has a ton of set electrics and neon and LED tape and atmospheric effects and smoke and whiz bangs and all sorts of stuff. Um, so it's quite busy and it's a lot more stuff than I could have managed back when I started 10 years ago. Um, and that there also wouldn't have been the money or the time to do on my earlier shows. Um, so obviously my more recent work is a lot more complicated. Um, and I guess you could say that makes it a lot more difficult, but also now I have a ton more support, you know, like you're working at Sadler's Wells, you have a production manager who's telling you what you can get, who's sourcing all the things, uh, wonderful production electricians who are rigging everything for you. So a lot of your brain space gets actually saved and you can just focus on the design. So I would say that um, things aren't necessarily a lot harder or more difficult now, um, but my challenges have changed and challenges are always changing as the technology evolves as well. Thank you. Um, so now we have a question that anyone can answer. So what's the hardest thing about finding employment in your field? Any volunteers? Uh, Hello. Yeah, Maria? Um, you, as an actor, obviously you have to do like endless auditions and um, like getting rejected over and over can be really hard. Um, and also uh, when you do a job, like a in-between job, uh, like working in a bar, it's usually shift work um, and you sometimes have to weigh up what's more important is uh, going, like going to this sh shift and making money or prepping for your um audition um which is really important so um yeah i would say that finding that balance is um is is, is really hard actually um yeah cool thank you and would anyone else like to answer that question roy go for it yeah um it's it's interesting because I, I guess like Rhea had, have had to do lots of stuff like that as well. Like um, the in-between time between like professional artistic gigs is, can be really, really challenging sometimes. And I think sometimes we have an, in, uh, I don't know, sometimes we have a tendency in our industry to, to get really frustrated by having to do that work outside of, of like artistic stuff. But I like I worked in nightclubs, I worked in bars, coffee shops, I did security work, I did a bit of cleaning, I worked in supermarkets, um, and and did lots of like tray holding at posh events and stuff like that. And actually something that I found over the years to come to appreciate about that work as well is that that allowed me to um to to like I don't know, build my like reservoir of knowledge about human beings and about the world. Cause I think sometimes we, you can get really trapped in a place when you're working in theatre where like everything is about theatre. So like the people that you, um, your friends are, are theatre people and the people that you fall in love with are theatre people. And, and like, sometimes you don't necessarily keep that connection with the world with, with people who are doing the nine to five. And I think there's something really important about um, those moments when you have to do that work. Um, like not looking at it, like, I guess trying to look at it as an opportunity to continue to grow and learn in the same way that Lucian and Ria have said that reading is really important, observing people and understanding human beings and, and why we behave the way that we do and the choices that we make. You can only get that from, from maybe like firsthand witnessing and that is something that fuels the imagination as well. It comes down to your definition of um, what you think work is. If you think work is only what you're paid to do, then, you know, it's, it's shift and turns. But if you think working um, is just improving yourself as an artist, then anything you can do 
can constitute kind of work. Um, so I'm a writer, but my work is also my hobby. When I'm not writing, I'm thinking of writing, but also doing the most ridiculous things contributes to creating memories or creating a bank of emotions which, contribute, which makes itself into a poem or into a play. Um, I was recently asked one of my favorite books by this big fancy Guardian interview, and I replied the Argos catalog and had to explain that when I was a kid, um, my father brought one back to Nigeria and I'd never seen anything like that before. So my sisters and I spent about three or four hours pouring through this thing and building up stories and building up armies with the toys we found in the toy section. So that was creativity. We were constructing stories out of things that we weren't, that we didn't have, but we were able to build narrative and structure with it. So this is what I mean being out there, take, like even looking through an Argus catalog, creating patterns between things is a creative process. It's, it's work, I was working at the time. I just didn't think of it at the time, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I mean. Cool, that's the best answer ever, cool. Uh, so B, do we have um, an audience question? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one member has, um, of the audience has said, you all speak with so much passion for the arts, has there ever been a time when that passion felt limited by others and how did you deal with it? You know, there is, passion is not something that can always be easily defined. You have to, uh, and as, as strong as it is, it is also incredibly delicate. So you, you have to be careful who you share your true passions and your true dreams with and be careful uh, that you don't over invest in other people's opinions of who or what you are. I have, if I listened personally to every single uh, uncle, aunt, uh, cousin, teacher who told me, oh no, you're, you're, you're too smart to be an actor. You should be a doctor like your father. You should have stayed, you should be, a, you know, I, I would be an incredibly unhappy person at, all, um, at this moment in time. But it's also important to remember that, especially in this business, um, and I realize it's incredibly um, contradictory for me to say this in, in a certain way, but if you want to make money and if you want to be famous, don't waste your time in this profession. There are many easier ways to make money. You can become a, a doctor, a lawyer, a computer person, you know. Um, if you want to be famous, you can go onto YouTube in two hours time, put a cup on your head and sing nursery rhymes, you'll be famous. If, those, if that is what you want, this is not the place for you. I can honestly and proudly say that I have been broke, drunk, nearly, <laughs> nearly destitute doing the thing that I love. And I've only grown as an artist. Of course, that doesn't mean be stupid, be crazy. No, but, it, but what it has taught me is that following your passion, it is always possible to make a living and it's always possible to grow as an artist. Exactly what everyone has been saying about, you know, your, your, your life is not just about being on the stage. Everything you do, every other job you do feeds you as um, an artist. So yeah, I'm simply echoing, don't listen to the negative voices. And also don't listen to people who don't know anything about the industry. It's a waste of time. There you go. Um, thank you. And Roy, I think we have time to hear from you on that as well. Um, cool. Yeah, I, I would say to that question, um, it's really interesting because like we want to give and we want to share, but it's also really hard sometimes to take criticism. And I, I, I mean, like echoing some of what Lucien said, like not all criticism is, is good criticism and not all criticism is informed either. And I think um, one of the things that has really helped me to guard the passion that I have is like by having, um, you know, like I said before, that tribe of people around me that can support me, that who can, who can be really honest with me actually about um, the work that I make and be really honest with me as a human being and help me to learn and help me to grow. Um, I also, um, after my like first sh or second show, I, I realized, um, like there was this reviewer who tweeted immediately after the show, this play that I did called The Mountaintop and said, um, never before have I witnessed 10 minutes of theater like the last 10 minutes of The Mountaintop. And it was like this gushing tweet and it like, 
it really made my head swell. But then in the review that he wrote, he only like it only got four stars. And <laughs> I know it's so pathetic, but when I saw that, even though I didn't think I cared about it, suddenly I realized the currency of like star ratings and stuff like that. Um, and it, it really affected me. And <laughs> And it even meant that I, I once in a social setting went up to this review and was like, so why didn't you give me five stars? Which is so pathetic. But that was the moment when I realized actually just how fragile my um, artistic instinct is and, and to, to like make it as strong and firm as it needs to be. I need to be really confident about the work that I'm making without necessarily thinking about, about what people write about it essentially so I feel like I often I, I stopped reading reviews then um, and and I only just follow my instincts and I allow the audience in the room to teach me about the work that I've made you know like actually seeing the way in which audiences react or don't react the silences paying really close attention to what those hundreds of people a night like give as their response to the work that in a way is so much more powerful and potent than understand like than getting four or five stars or three stars or two stars actually and yeah that really has freed me actually um from the shackles great um thank you for all those great answers from everyone um so over to you amiga thank you um now to start our third um section on overcoming obstacles we have a question for our audience over to you anisha and elijah hi everyone we are back again and this time we would like to know what barriers you're facing getting into the creative industries we've sent out the poll so please start answering You should choose the barriers that you think most applies to you. Your options are... Hold on, amigo. I'm um, sorry, Alicia. I was actually blocked from using my video. So I'm just going to say the question. Um, you should choose the barriers that you think more, most accurately applies to you. Your options are A, you don't have the correct knowledge about jobs within the media industry. B, you were never able to find accurate information about the, sorry, creative industry, not media industry, creative industry from your school. C, you are not confident in your ability to earn a profit, a profit, sorry, from a career in the creative industry. D, you don't know how to start educating yourself or to acquire the necessary skills to have a career within the creative industry. Okay, so let's see what you guys are saying. Most people, hold on, let me bring that back up. Right, I lost that now. Um, okay, so most people have voted for, I don't know how to start training or looking for a job in the creative industry, which is very interesting looking at all the barriers you guys are facing as young people in the creative industry. Thank you for taking part and let's head back over to Kirsty. Um, thanks. So panelists, it's back to you. We'd like to hear more about the obstacles you've had to overcome and your aspirations for the future. Um, our first question is open for anyone to answer. Uh, how do you deal with competition within the industry without letting it affect your confidence or self-esteem? Who is interested in answering that question? Inuna, go for it. Um, um, how do I deal with competition? Well, a couple of things. One is um, the creative industry um, and, and when you're a writer, what you're really striving for after years and years is, is, is sounding and creating work that sounds like yourself, right? And by that, I mean, if people want a Shakespeare play, they'll go and ask Shakespeare, right? If, if, 
Um, and if people want, if, if you keep comparing yourself to another writer and trying to emulate their work because you think it equates success, they're always going to be one step ahead of you if you compete along those lines. So all you have to really do is ask yourself what makes you you and write work that is seeped into your identity, your sense of self. And the more you do so, the more you're true or honest with yourself, the more you stand out. And then you're not competing with anyone, you're just competing with yourself. It becomes about how to outdo yourself. Um, I like to think about in race, sorry, in life, that you're running a race against yourself. And even if you lose, you still win. And that's how I always um, focus on, on work. The question becomes, what do I want to write next? This is not what does someone else write and how do I write in response to that? It always comes down to your identity, to, to my truth and trying to write that and dramatize that. I hope mm. that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you. Does anyone else want to answer? Um, Roy, go for it. Um, yeah, I would say that like, um, I don't think that you, there is any competition really, like there is only you. Um, and if you are taking an audition as a competition, um, or, you know, like, I don't know, every job that you get is not for you. Um, and, and yeah, when you don't get a job, sometimes there's a really good reason that you didn't get that job as well. And I think it's really important to yeah, it's just really important to remember that like actually to be an artist it's about uh, like you using yourself as a vehicle for expression and you can do that at any point and you don't necessarily need permission to do that um, and you can find and create your own channels to do that and you can apply for money to do that um, from lots of different people and you can do it in your house or you can do it in your garden or you can try and do it in a theater or in a hall or whatever it's it's like you don't but you're not I don't think it's a really healthy idea to imagine that you're competing and I feel like the moment that I realize I like actually there's nobody else in the world actually who is me um that that in a way that became my superpower because nobody can do Roy better than Roy I guess and nobody can do Kirsty or Amiga or Inua or Lucian or Ria or any of you nobody can do you better than you can and so I guess in a way it kind of echoes what Inua said but the idea of competition is is one that that you should like work really hard to get rid of where wherever possible great um and so I think Clancy and Ria also had your hands up before and now Shadisha too so let's try and hear from you all um so Clancy should we go to you on this one sure um I definitely agree with what Roy and Inua said, and also I know it's a little bit different when you're a designer, but um, it's important to remember that your community are the people you're in competition with, if you know what I mean, and that sometimes you're going to learn the most from people that you might consider your competition. You're going to share experiences with those people, and they could be your best friends in the industry. Um, so I'd say try and let go of the idea of competition and embrace the idea of sharing ideas. Um, people who you might think you're in closest competition with, especially if you're a designer, they might be the one that recommend you for a job that they can't do or that they feel like you'd be better at doing. So if you can think about creating a network and a group of friends that support each other rather than people that you're you know, elbowing against, I think you'll be a lot happier and have a healthier career as well. Thank you. Uh, and Ria, did you have your hand up for this one? Am I right? Yeah, um, it's, I'm basically just echoing what everyone else has said, but I got given the advice that um, you know something that no one else does about each character that you have the privilege to enact, don't lose heart. And I think like I hold on to that, that it's like really important to remember that you are unique and you're not really in, in competition with anyone else because as an actor, you're bringing all of your own life experience and as well as researching, um, but you, no, no one could do it the same, the same way that you can. And that's like really, that's really special. And that's something that you can hold on to. And um, yeah, no, no, no one can take that away from you, um, which I, I've always found quite like, that, that gives me confidence knowing that. 
Thank you. Um, and so we now have a question from Jonathan. Um, as I'm interested in graphic design, Jermaine, you work as a film editor on well-known TV shows, but you also have your own post-production studios in Manchester. How do you continue to build a reputation as a respected professional in your own field? And how do you decide to go where to go next? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess it's passion, really. Um, obviously, I think no matter how sometimes boring an edit job might be, or it's not as good as another one, if you kind of like don't show the passion through what you love, regardless of what it is, um, I kind of I kind of think people can sense it, and I always kind of go off the frame as like sometimes you're only as good as your last job, so and that's what people remember you by. So I kind of think like over over the time that's where I've built up a lot of respect um, with a lot of different production companies. Um, and obviously there's a, there's a small amount of, I won't say a small amount, but you need to know what you're doing and a skill set within, within that. Um, so yeah. And I kind of guess obviously keep smiling as well. A lot mm. of people love it when you smile, especially when it's high pressure jobs and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, if, as long as you can smile and, and like not kind of hide the tears, because at the end of the day, we do love what we do. And so this is why we do it, um, I think, constantly. Uh, and then, yeah, always treat your job as the last one, um, as like I said. And uh, I kind of, I don't know. I also like, you need to keep contact with people a lot. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you kind of want to be in it and have been noticed, to keep up the work, um, you've got to be in people's sight, um, whether that's an email, um, you bump into them. I mean, obviously I started off as making cups of tea and that was probably the most important job I ever had because that is what got me talking to a lot of people and started building up a portfolio of contacts. And then in the future, you end up meeting them contacts again when you've progressed, I kind of guess in a way. Um, where I'm going next? I don't know. Um, <laughs> kind of where, where the wind takes me, to be honest. Um, I'm happy with how, like, everything I'm doing at the moment. I'm happy with, obviously, the post-production house is, is quite new. So that's keeping me on my toes and keeping me busy. Um, but yeah, I, the, yeah, I kind of just, I don't know, I just kind of go with what I like doing. I mean, kind of echoing everyone else, don't, do you know what I mean? Don't do something if you don't like it, I kind of guess. And if you don't like it, you're probably in the wrong job. Um, keep the passion going, really. So yeah, that'll be it. Okay, that answer the question? You. Yeah? Yeah, that's the last question. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. yeah um, so my next question is for Ria. What has been your most challenging role and how did you manage it? Um, it was definitely the play that I was just doing um, that got shut down because of COVID. It was called The Welkin by Lucy Kirkwood at the National in the Littleton Theatre. And I played the role of Sally Poppy. And um, the way that Lucy wrote the script, um, she wrote it like in the Suffolk rhythm, which meant that the sentences were like really, really, really long and they had anachronisms in them, which meant that it was like a huge workout vocally um, and also um, quite a strong accent. So I was working hard for like clarity a lot of the time, um, which was new, quite new for me, I think. And also the cast were all on stage um, pretty much together for the majority of it in a big empty room with not like not much set. So there was nowhere to hide. Um, you had to be like on and listening the whole time. Um, and I was, I was stood up and in, in handcuffs for the majority of it as well. So it was like physically demanding as well as vocally demanding. 
Um, and we had to like really work as an ensemble in order to pull the play off. So even if your characters hated each other and are arguing on stage, we had to be a really supportive and encouraging group as the actors. Um, and also like the Littleton is notoriously a very hard space because it's so big. And so I constantly felt like I was trying to find the right balance of being truthful um, as well as sharing it out to the audience um, without being like cheesy. Um, so the more performances we did, the better like it, it became. And I think that sometimes you just, you just need the experience and you aren't always mm -hmm. gonna get it right or perfect the first try um, because like by far the best person at doing this was June Watson, who is in her eighties and her like, I am a huge, like I admire her so much because her stagecraft is amazing and she's done about 20 plays or something at the national. So um, it had become like second nature for her. So I'd watch her a lot um, and I asked, as many questions to the director as possible, um, practice the accent every day in the evenings, on the day off. Um, I tried to keep healthy by not drinking too much and eating good food in order to have good energy levels. Um, but I also just tried um, like loads of different things until it felt right. So the previews and in some ways, like the first few weeks of performance for me were still me trying to play and find Sally. Um, so I've got like a couple of friends who I really trust, um, who I invited to come and see the show um, early on and then a couple of weeks later, just to get their feedback and their opinion. Um, and um, yeah, just carried on working, like the work, the work never, never stopped on that. So that's answered the question. <laughs> no, that was great, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Kirsty? Uh, so I'd like to ask Inua, um, so a lot of your plays centre on like the experience of um, the immigrant is one of your themes. Um, I was wondering like what you think the function of theatre is and what you hope to achieve with it. It's quite a big question. Oh wow. Um... I write a lot about immigration, or rather immigration is a constant theme in my work because um, I'm an immigrant and um, I'm st I still don't have British citizenship and I was refused that this year um, by the Home Office. Um, so it's a constant struggle, so it's always in my mind and I sort of find ways for it to be a part um, of the stories that I tell. But also I live in London and, and um, London is home to immigrants from right across the world. Um, what do I think the function of theatre? Um, Theatre is about the togetherness of storytelling. We sit um, in a room and we watch a story unfold. And in doing so, we learn things about each other together. And we are tied, um, we're tied into the storytelling. We're watching this thing uh, unfold and it's only real for everyone in the room. It's, it's, it's real for us and it's, it only exists because of us and it's, it's the completion of the equation. The actors, the directors, the writers, we think we have something but it's only complete when an audience comes. There's something that I find constantly holy about that equation, that completion. It's all of it is a leap of faith so I'm drawn to that. But I think the function of theatre is to teach us to be present. There's this thing where everyone's um, heartbeat unites um, at least once in a theater where we, we all beat at the same time. There's something so sacred about that. And, um, and I think coming together and being invested in the same thing for duration of time doesn't really happen in many other places um, in, in our world. One of the most fantastic thing I've witnessed was at the Littleton. I was watching the play, I forgot it, where, what it was, but it was someone um, in the audience who had a heart attack. The stage manager comes on and stops the play and asks, is there a director in the, is, is there a doctor in the audience? And there was a doctor in the audience who leapt out of his seat and ran down and looked after the gentleman. And once the gentleman was stabled and the ambulance was on the way, from the ground, he spoke to the stage manager saying, I'm okay, carry on with the play. And they did, and they finished the play. But that is something I'll never forget. He was invested in the storytelling. The audience was invested in the play, but also invested in his health. And we, we, we created that moment together. Um, I think it's holy 
and and that's one of the things I think it teaches us just about being present and being together. Thank you, thank you very much. That was really good. Um, we don't have a huge um, amount of time, but would anyone else like to add more about what the arts do for society, um, particularly in a time like this? Anyone can answer that. Repeat yes. the question. Oh, okay. Um, this, uh, well, uh, what is the function of theatre and what are you trying to achieve with it? Oh, it's not for me then. <laughs> well, or it can it, be any it, you know, I said it perfectly, you know, this is, it is a type of a holy communion. We get, we have been gathering as human beings, as cultures, as societies from the beginning of time. Take away the technology, take away the, 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 the faff, the glitz, the glamour. Stories are how we get to understand each other, how we make sense of ourselves from the most basic fairy tales that we ever learnt as children to the great epics written by all the, the great writers, including our very own Inua uh, here. But this, it is, it is about communion. It is about um, having a, a cultural uh, uh, preservation uh, and celebration of all that we are. And I think it's, it is even more important, especially now, as the world has gone into shutdown, especially now as technology races ahead in beautiful, beautiful ways to never ever forget that we are underpinned by the communion of stories. We must never ever lose that. It's nothing to do with race, class, age, gender, money, whether you're from the North, South, East, West. These are the things that bind us in communion and there is great power and great magic in that. And we must never ever forget that. Thank you. Um, would anyone else um, would like to answer? Yes, um, Roy. Yeah, um, I guess just to add to that, like right now, um, it feels as if um, everything is at, like, it feels like we're at sea and we can't really see a shore. Like it feels like people, we're all finding it really, really difficult, I guess, to imagine what the future will be. And, and what it is. And actually, um, people are making decisions about what that is every moment of the day as we go on. And we all are, as human beings, playing a part of that as well. Um, and I think right now, the thing that I've realized is that like, society needs imagination. They need the artists right now to help us to understand what it is that we've just been doing locked up in our houses for 12 weeks and and like what it was all for especially because you know this virus is something that we can't see or because that you know the virus of racism which has been exposed during this time is something that like you can absolutely not encounter if it isn't something that directly affects you and I think um yeah it just feels right now that the one thing that we can do is like we can continue to provoke people with art. We can continue to, to like allow people to ask the right questions that help us to, to like brace ourselves for, for whatever might be ahead. Um, and just in a really practical level as well, um, you know, like we've had conversations with the local schools in Manchester at the Royal Exchange and, and you know, they're really struggling with the idea of how they're going to teach in, 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 like in with social distancing and whatever um and we've spoken to artists as well and there have been brilliant artists designers who have gone oh well we can work with local educational authorities and and help to design ways in which social distancing like can can not look like some weird um i don't know uh some some kind of like dystopian thriller do you know what I mean? Like with plastic sheets everywhere and that like actually our creativity can help to, to design what life will look and feel like in this next period of time. Because there is, there is creativity in everything, in the, the, the bricks that are used outside of our houses to the clothes that we wear, the, the blue paint on the wall behind Amiga to the, the hat that Inua wears. There's creativity in all of that. And I think we forget that sometimes. So we like, yeah, it's just remembering how much power we do have right now 
and how much stories and narrative will help us to to like shape what our future will be or, or prepare us for whatever the future might be ahead of us. Thank you um, very much. I'm going to move on because of time. Um, so we have one more question for you before we take some um, audience questions, but we're going to do this in a bit of a different way. Elijah and Alicia. Um, for the last question, we're going to ask the audience to select which one of the panelists they would rather have answered the question. The question is, where was, the question is, was there ever a point where you lost motivation and how did you get it back? Please go ahead and cast your vote for who you'd like to answer. Okay, so the audience have spoken and they want uh, In you are sorry, I was trying to see who it was. In you are to answer. Was there a time where you ever, when you've lost motivation, how did you get it back? Um, yeah, this happens um, in in many facets, in many ways, and 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 um, in many ways, shapes, and form. Um, the darkest time was um, just before the fourteenth tale. Um, um, just before I wrote it, this was when um, the Home Office had sent a letter to my family asking us to leave the country. And I'd stopped writing poetry after that terrible period in Glastonbury and I moved into theater, I wrote my first play and um, no one had come to see it, um, or, or so I believed. And I just thought there was no point writing. The Home Office that told me to leave the country felt like we'll be kicked out and there was no point actually doing anything. And I was completely, completely depressed um, and I had no motivation to do anything, it, you know. But then um, I got an email from um, a small, tiny theater company, which, which were a few at the time, asking me to come in for a meeting. And I went there and I met these two lovely women uh, who wanted to commission and work on the play. And out, of, um, and out of that conversation, my motivation came back. I was really embarrassed about having you know, impossible immigration systems. And I didn't really, sorry, immigration status. And I didn't tell anyone about any, any of the problems that I was going through. But when I did let them into my life and tell them, what I got back was complete support. So I had to trust them and I had to be vulnerable and to share how precarious my mind was, my life was at the time. But all I got was support and feedback and love. Um, and that's how I, how I got out of it. Um, and I think every, every time I've been in tight situations like that, rather than keeping it to myself, I just try and talk to people. Sometimes I talk to complete strangers at the bus. Sometimes I reach out to my sisters, to my friends. Sometimes I play basketball with my boys. And when we're sweating, you know, pacing up and down on the court is when I'm talking and I work things through that way and motivation comes. Um, no man is an island. Don't ever attempt or think that you are because that way leads certain downfall. Always, um, try and be, be vulnerable because it really when you when you hit rock bottom the only place is up and when i'm vulnerable i just reach out to people and i talk and a lot of my motivation my confidence comes back that way so don't don't suffer in silence that 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 disintegrating mental health problems that all you get from that always be open be vulnerable um and it's always it's always worked out for me well that way thank you for that um so that's the end of our questions for you. Victoria, do we have time for some audience questions? Um, okay, so Victoria is saying that we only have time for two more audience questions. Be been monitoring the Q&A. So what do people want to know? Yeah, okay. Um, so the first question is, what do you think of the arts um, can do to help people who have mental health challenges? I guess I could talk about that because I hinted at it in my in my answer. Um, I so most of the time I write poetry, which means that um, um, I'm, I, I live in my feelings a lot. I'm always in my feelings, and I write it 
down and I try to figure out some way to shepherd it, to shape the text into something that's artistic. And maybe I'm guided by sonics, by what, what the sound of the words that I'm writing and that's a way of beautifying the text and carving it into something. But, um, um, and like Lucian mentioned this before, write it down, get it out of your system, that it's one, and it's easier to write a poem than it is to write a play or to write a symphony, you know, so write it down as a poem, find some way to shape it. And that is, that is, that requires you to meditate, to go over and over again, to process these things. A very simple, but incredibly rewarding and cathartic thing to do. Write a poem, get it out of your system. And then after that, share it with people you trust. It, it, it opens yourself up to conversation, to dialogue, to meaning, to importance. Um, so yeah, just write a poem, that's what I do. Great. Um, so one final audience question is, how do you gain confidence when things don't go uh, as well as you expected? And I think we can only allow one person to answer this one. Anyone up for it? Oh, Clancy? Yeah, quick answer. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, um, well, I kind of guess um, I've been in many situations of where uh, obviously lack of confidence and felt a bit obviously not down um, and, and obviously you kind of be your own worst enemy against well I am anyway and I always I, I knock myself even further down but what I've learned over the years is it's it, it's it's only obviously a tv show or it's only a video you know what I mean it's um so not to get caught up with it too much and and the best medicine for it is just to get back on the horse and just obviously as soon as possible um because even though they could have been a bad experience from the last job the the next one to somehow on usually all the time ends up being absolutely brilliant so um it's just keep on going um and i think all the people have said it you know what i mean when you do get knocked down and you're at bottom you seem to obviously it's only one way to go then it's up so yeah, just just keep and keep going and don't uh, let it affect you. I kind of guess. Is that okay. Awesome, um, Amiga, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you for all your questions. Although we would um, talk to our panelists all day, it is now time to finish our events. Uh, so we would like to say a big thank you to all our panellists for being involved in Opening Doors 2020. Um, it's a scary time to be considering a future as a creative, but you've uh, given us hope that the industry will survive and thrive. And thank you for being a great audience today. Um, we hope that this conversation has inspired you. We need your feedback on the event. We've put a link in the chat to an evaluation form and we'll also send this out via email. Please fill out this form and let us know about what you've taken away from this event.